On March 26, 1931, headlines shouted the important news that Fred Burke had been captured. One of America's most dangerous criminals had reached the end of his career, which had included some of the most cold-blooded murders in the history of crime. Burke had gained his reputation as the most dangerous man alive by his alleged participation in more than a score of murders, including the brutal St. Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago. However, the papers gave little credit to the amateur detective who caused his capture and the small band of men who affected it. In producing this film, not a detail has been changed. It is the true story of the discovery and capture of Burke. The actors are the very people who participated in it. The scenes are the actual places in which the various events took place. Of course, it was impossible to have Burke there to take his own part, for at the time of filming, he had started his life sentence in the Michigan State Penitentiary. Olin Webb of Milan, Missouri, who takes the part of Fred Burke. Joseph Hunsacker, 30-year-old reader of detective stories and self-styled sleuth. Alan D. Morrison, attorney, who aided Hunsacker in effecting Burke's capture. Detective Swepson of the St. Joseph, Missouri Police Force. Detective Ray Kelly, also of the St. Joseph Force. Genial Captain Lard, St. Joseph detective. He looks pleasant, and he is, but he's plenty mean with a machine gun. A.W. Tettinger, also a detective on the St. Joseph Force. Mrs. Barney Porter, Burke's mother-in-law. Burke's father-in-law, a typical Missouri farmer. L.C. Hoover, Sheriff of Sullivan County, Missouri. Deputy Pickett, Constable of Green City. Does he look mean? There. That's better. I'll bet someone offered him a drink. Kelly in St. Joseph, Michigan. He appeared in Green City, Missouri, where he stayed until his subsequent capture. It is a town of about 800 inhabitants, 160 miles north and east of St. Joseph. It is interesting to note that it is in the heart of the district that was once the stamping ground of Jesse James, and not far from the hangouts of the famous Egan's Rats. Here is the square of the peaceful little town. Here Burke was well liked, mainly because of his extreme generosity. His favorite saying was, keep the chain. He always had enough $50 bills in his pocket to paper a good-sized room. Even after he was convicted of murder in Benton Harbor, Michigan, some of the townspeople resented Hunsacker's turning him in. Burke was identified through a picture in a detective story magazine. Joe Hunsacker devoured every word of every detective story that he could obtain with a ravenous appetite. He spent his evenings analyzing crimes and dreaming of himself as a one-man Scotland Yard. The townspeople kidded him frequently about this trait. He certainly laughed best and last when he brought about Burke's capture. Burke did not come to town often. Usually, he showed up at the Shell gas station where Hunsacker worked about once a week. Hunsacker's suspicion of Burke was aroused while he was serving him at this station. Burke always seemed extremely nervous. He always left the engine of his car running when he got out of it. Evidently, he is contemplating the purchase of a new set of tires. The ones in his car seem to be in excellent condition, but he isn't taking any chances in case he has to make a speedy getaway. Joe Hunsacker spent his time at the filling station as he did elsewhere, reading detective stories and studying crime. His suspicions are already aroused as to Burke's criminal past, so he studies the man at every opportunity. It was a queer quirk of fate that Burke's preference for a certain kind of gasoline brought him into contact with the only man in Green City who was interested in finding out who he really was, where he had come from, and where his endless supply of $50 bills had its origin. Burke's father-in-law, who was with him, never had an inkling of his past. He was entirely ignorant of it until the time of his capture. In fact, he refused to believe it until the identification was positively established. Burke posed as a wealthy real estate man from DeKalb, Illinois. Porter's daughter says that he was an ideal husband. Burke was most considerate of the folks at home. 
He rarely returned to the farm without some candy or some ice cream. On this day is to be ice cream. The woman behind the counter is Miss Beale, who was subsequently married to lawyer Morrison. Burke looks at the detective story magazines, evidently slightly uneasy because of their presence in the town where he was hiding. He pays her with the customary, keep the change. It is strange that more people were not suspicious of him, but he didn't come into town very often. He wasn't seen again after this day until over a week later. Meanwhile, Joe had bought a new issue of his favorite magazine. In it is a picture of Fred Burke. It looks too much like Porter's son-in-law to be a coincidence. Joe is sure that this is the man, and is so absorbed in his dreams of possible success and reward that he does not hear the arrival of the car. Burke sounds his horn impatiently. His nervousness is all out of place in the peaceful community, where no one is ever in a hurry. Hunsecker is anxious to see Burke again, and here's his opportunity. He is very excited. Burke tells his father-in-law that he intends to go to Kansas City soon. His leaving town frequently was one of the biggest problems that Hunsecker and Morrison had to deal with in arranging the capture. Burke always had his tank filled to overflowing on his way back to the farm, even if it took only a gallon. This is one of the little details that originally aroused Hunsecker's suspicions. Hunsecker is sure enough of himself now to write for additional information on Burke. At noon, he writes to the Department of Justice, asking for further particulars on the man. Realizing the need for absolute secrecy, he does not dare submit his letter to the prying eyes of the small town post office, so he takes the letter over to the station shortly before the arrival of the daily train. No village gossip shop is going to spoil his little party. He feels that he can trust the agent of the station, but to make sure, he asks him not to mention the letter to anybody. The agent promises and Joe and Morrison were able to depend on him fully in this respect. Joe has also asked him to keep the letter in a safe place where no one will see it, so he locks it up in a drawer until train time. This letter was rather incoherent and illegible, so the Department of Justice, who received it at Washington, communicated with lawyer Morrison asking him to find out what it was all about. In this manner, he was unwillingly brought into partnership with Hunsaker. While the train waits, there seems to be some argument about the letter. The gent in overalls is protesting the complete lack of address. It looks to him like some child's letter to Santa Claus. The agent tells him and put it on the train as he told him to do in the first place. Shortly after Morrison heard from Washington in reply to this letter, he meets Joe and asks him how his detective work is coming along. Joe is forced to confide in him and they agree to cooperate in capturing Burke and share in the rewards. Morrison agrees to take care of the details and correspondence with the police. The necessity of establishing a meeting place to talk things over from time to time presents itself, and so Morrison rents an office from his old friend, Justice of the Peace Border. It is located on the top floor of a Green City skyscraper and is ideal for the use that they have in mind, for it overlooks the square. Joe is still hungry for more information, so he goes into the newsstand to try and obtain more dope on Burke from other detective story magazines. In the meantime, Morrison thinks it over and decides to telegraph Washington for information. He looks out of the window and notices with approval that the view of the square is exactly what they want to observe Burke on his visits to town. He also realizes the need of speed, so he loses no time in the preparation of the telegram. I like the idea of being involved in this detective proposition but he hasn't any choice to do otherwise. He too is convinced that Hunsacker is on the right track. He is a little nervous about the station agent. Naturally, he will know the contents of the wire. So he admonishes him to keep his mouth shut. 
A few hours later, he has a reply from Washington, and he calls Joe to his office to read it. Morrison and Hunsaker have quite a discussion. They can't decide whether to turn the case over to the Chicago or the St. Joseph Police Department. Hunsaker says that he would rather turn it over to the police in his native state. Morrison believes that there is less danger of the plans leaking out in writing to St. Joe. He is afraid that the details would get back to Burke if it were taken up with the Chicago Police Department. So that they decide to write to St. Joseph for their information. Morrison hates to take a chance on using the mails, but there is no other way out. However, he takes as few chances as he possibly can and carries the letter to the post office himself. Here's the police station at St. Joseph where Morrison's letter was opened by Chief Matthews of the police force. Chief Matthews, the man with the letter, is evidently puzzled as to what it's all about. Nevertheless, he doesn't want to take any chances on missing an opportunity, so he's talking it over with Detectives Kelly and Swepston. He tells them that if this man is Burke, it is a very serious matter, and they'll have to act quickly, thoroughly, and most efficiently. This police department handled this matter well. They acted with caution, but when they did act, they knew what they were doing. He decides to answer Morrison and tells Kelly and Swepson to get all of the dope on Burke out of the file and go down to Green City and make an investigation for themselves. Meanwhile, Burke has returned to Green City, and he unwittingly drives up to buy gasoline from the man who has already started the machinery in motion that is to result in his capture. A few days later, Joe was still studying Burke's picture. If this isn't his man, he will be the laughing star unity, so he has to be sure. It's awfully fortunate that Burke never caught Joe with a magazine. If he had, it had been just too bad for Joe. Joe is positive that this is Burke. He decides that he hasn't enough opportunity to observe Burke in the station, so he arranges to work for a few days in his sister's restaurant. On his daily trip to the post office two days later, Morrison gets a reply from Chief Matthews at St. Joseph, so he hurries to his office where he has an appointment with Joe. They have both been on pins and needles for days, and they are anxious to find out more about their man.